for the first time, it was the unrest in the early 80s in Iraq and Iran. We were doing maternity hospitals in Iraq, several locations. The Kurds were in the Northern Territories. These two employees were commuting from one city to another in Northern Iraq. Ronaldo Franceschi and Guy Beauvert. One was an American, the other was a Canadian. Ronaldo and Guy were stopped on the highway by what they thought were Iraqi border guards. It turned out they were Kurds. The Kurds took them up in the mountains and they were trying to demand a ransom. For the longest time, there was no word of them. They were traveling with these nomadic bands, uh, cold nights, uh, tough living food conditions. So it was uh, critical that we get over there and try and do some damage control. ATCO here in Calgary set up a crisis management office that served as a 24-7 command center to work with the international aid agencies. Mr. Southern phoned the prime minister and opened some doors, and the Iraqi ambassador came in on a weekend and issued the visa for me. They had the top minds of the company involved on a very immediate and intense basis. To make a long story short, it took six months to get these two employees back without paying any ransom and in good health. Today, for the first time, Guy Boisvert told the story of his capture at gunpoint, his forced march over rugged mountain terrain, and his life with the Kurdish guerrillas. And I was thinking, uh, I don't think ATCO could have done any more for these two employees. You know, if it was the daughters of the Southerns that were kidnapped, we couldn't have done any more. And it kind of makes you feel uh, proud of that fact. People think of a company as a company, and this is something very different. We always speak in terms of heart and mind, and heart in business usually connotes power, pumping, driving, but in ATCO, heart also truly carries with it empathy, feeling, kindness. There's a context, a humanness, people who actually know who you are and, and uh, you know about them, and it's family. ATCO has always been synonymous with family. And then as it grew, it became a team. It is a sense that we all rely on each other. We know we all have different tasks and roles, but we can count on each other, just like a family. It's a remarkable story when you think about it, starting off in the backyard. How many Canadian companies have got a story like that to tell? Not many. It's a story for the ages, and it needs to be told, and it should be told. You can go into a bar in the middle of Australia, sidle up to the bar, in comes an outbacker, you know, he orders a beer. He says, haven't we got good swimmers and tennis players? And he's proud of it. And in Canada, we're proud of our hockey players, aren't we? Why can't we be proud of our industry, of our people, of our opportunities? My first memory of Alco uh, is uh, my father proposing that we form it to uh, try to get enough money for me to go to university. Ron was cutting grass and doing lawns in, in uh, Mount Royal, and he saw this big trailer, and it was, uh, this man said, do you think you could find some way to sell this? And Ron said, well, yeah, so he hauled it home. About three days later, I get home from school, and my mother's there, and she sold this thing. Somebody had driven by, and they were going to go to the oil field to work, and they didn't have any place to live. That swooshing sound you just heard was the Imperial Oil Limited number one well at Leduc, Alberta, coming into production. The oil started flowing under its own pressure at 4 o'clock this afternoon, Thursday, February 13th, in what may be a momentous occasion in the oil world. And that was an absolute revelation. 
You know, we didn't realize it at the time, but Leduc had been discovered. There was no housing for people. And uh, so then they thought, well, you know what we should do is we should get into getting trailers. So when Ron was 17, he would fly down to Eastern Canada and buy trailers and haul them back and then sell them on the lot. And as a result, we became the largest house trailer dealer in North America. At one point, he met a gentleman that worked for Shell Oil Company, Jim Turner. I told him a couple of house trailers. He said, Ron, these damn things are cold. They're coming apart. We got to get something that will be strong and warm. So that kind of got them thinking, well, we should, we should try to manufacture something in our own backyards. When you think of what was out there when they started, I mean, they lived in tents or lean-tos. It was horrific conditions. And ATCO came along and provided a, a, a far better, more comfortable, safer environment for people to work and live in. The manufacturing was conducted by a man named Jerry Kiefer, who went on to be our senior vice president of production. Jerry Kiefer, who just recently passed away. I think he built the first industrial unit uh, that probably Ron drew on the back of a match package. My dad was employee number four, uh, working for ADCO. He was a uh, immigrant from Germany as a young man, carpenter by training. I was about eight or 10 years of age, and up back these huge trucks to our house with these bales of cotton. My mom was a seamstress and uh, sewed the drapes and mattress covers for all of the ATCO units. And my mom and dad promptly told us how we were gonna cut these sails of cotton into these strips that my mom would take and then sew into mattress covers for the workforce housing mattresses. In those very early days, the people were committed to the cause and prepared to work very hard toward an outcome. We'd spend our first summer jobs doing that and we got paid we got paid absolutely nothing to do that. <laughs> My dad's view was, we're all doing this for ADCO. There's a core of people whose heart and mind are absolutely a part of this company. People like John Wood, Cam Richardson, Otto Steiner, Jerry Kiefer, Norm Robertson, those kind of people really formed the core that allowed the company to move beyond being a manufacturing and workforce housing company. With my grandfather and my father and those three men, Jerry Kiefer, Norm Robertson, and Cam Richardson, this company started punching way above its weight. The project that really kicked ATCO into the bigger league was the Boeing contract. The Minuteman was being built all across the northern part of the United States, just below the 49th parallel. Minuteman has also demonstrated the feasibility of the fire from the whole concept. They were building these big silos for the missiles that were going to protect North America from the Russians. All of these missile launcher systems are currently under construction, but the task is staggering in scope and complexity. We couldn't get the bureaucracy of the U.S. Air Force and Boeing to agree that they would use us. Mr. Bud Hurst was in charge of it. So Mark said to me, When did you last talk to Mr. Hurst? And he said, oh, I haven't talked to him for months. I said, we know where he lives, and you're going to see him. Our bank at the time was really yipping at us because we had a $5 million line of credit, and they didn't believe that anybody could go from Calgary to Boeing and Seattle and sell. So we did that, and we drove over, and we waited until the lights went on in the house. Ron gets out of the car, goes and knocks on the door, and Mrs. Hurst answers the door. And she said, yes, Mrs. Hurst, come in. I'll get you a cup of coffee. 15, 20 minutes later, Bud showed up, and I told him this story. And at about 5 or 6 o'clock at night, I'm looking at two purchase orders. I still see them. with the color of Boeing Minuteman, and we had the two orders. It was about a $10 million contract. You can imagine the sense of relief. Can you imagine this little company called ATCO with only about five or six employees at 805 3rd Street Northeast could possibly talk to a big company like Boeing? The Boeing contract really gave us a little more stability and it was, it was very, very instrumental. Success is a combination of, of good luck and, and good timing and, and good ideas. And uh, those three came together 
in ATCO, I think, in that, at that period in time. Once we started to develop the building block approach to housing, it led to orders in Pakistan and Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, very, very large orders, which required a whole new set of skills, people, processes. We can hire about six, and the other 10 can come from our experienced people in Australia and Calgary. Gentlemen, here we have the total Saudi game plan. Oh, and be sure the customs people know that it's 19 complete schools plus the camp. Yes, the Saudi Arabian consulate in New York City. Yes, good, yeah, I'll wait. It was invigorating, it was challenging, it was exciting. The world was theirs to explore, and they had this amazing product that nobody else had. In Washington, we were after Washington contracts. In New York, there were a lot of major contractors. San Francisco, the same way. Just a lot of contractors doing a lot of bidding internationally then. So there was a lot happening, and uh, we tried to just hook our wagon to it. You know, in those days, it wasn't like we had a strong balance sheet. You had whatever customer you had on the end of that contract, and that was it. And when that job was done, if you didn't have the next job lined up, you were shutting down. The peaks and valleys were very, very very swingy, you know, you'd have a big peak and then you have, wouldn't have any work. I can remember one of my dad's sayings. He said, you know, the only thing worse than a government contract is no contract. <laughs> we had just moved the factory from Airdrie to Lincoln Park. We didn't have a lot of work in that factory. But Ron came out and we gathered everyone in the factory and he said, this thing's going to turn around. There's the lows, there's the highs in this industry and it's going to come back and this factory will be humming again. That kind of energy is contagious. It's something very profound about how positive energy in fact does affect the people that are around you. And that's very much a part of the Atco success story. The company was growing. They had already opened an operation in Australia. Peter Bodden had a drilling company in Calgary, and he was going to do drilling in Australia. And he said, Ron, if you can build camps for us in Canada, could you build us a camp in Australia? And Ron said, yeah, I could. As I recall the story, they forgot to bid the import duties on the camp that they had sold, and that was 40%. We came close to losing that company on several occasions. And of course, Peter Bodden said, a contract's a contract. And Atco's position was, we will fill the contract. We managed to get through that one, too. And then, of course, it grew into an operation in Adelaide. And now we're really becoming international. Now we're more than just a local little shop in Calgary. The thing that always amazed me was they were forging new ground. They created a whole industry out of nothing. It was something that had never been done. Our subject tonight is a kind of global landlord. Ronald D. Southern is a 35-year-old Canadian who is the younger partner in a father-son team that builds entire cities. In just 18 years, Ron Southern's industrial housing company has grown from a $1,500 investment to a $20 million a year business, the largest of its kind in the world. You'd be sailing along and you figured you were doing everything right and then suddenly there was a roadblock in front of you and all. We gotta, we gotta get by it. At one stage, as we were growing, I read an article in Time magazine about the formation of companies in the Bahamas, tax haven companies. ATCO had a company called ATCO International, and it was a Bahamas-based company, and it was just a sales organization, and it would sell product in North Africa, say, and it would be built in Australia or in Montreal. So if we sold a uh, order offshore, which we're starting to do, we'd sell it to the ATCO trading in the Bahamas at a certain price, and they would mark it up 5% and sell it to the customer. But the 5%, of course, is tax-free. There was an entrepreneurial moment there in this country uh, where we weren't quite so steeped in bureaucracy, where we weren't quite so uh, hung up on uh, doing things all by the book. After about a year, uh, there was a man named Vern Tilly with the Canadian Revenue. 
he was going to do an audit on whether we were avoiding taxes, only to come back about, I don't know, six months later and say, you have been avoiding taxes and we're going to charge you. So there was an ensuing battle and a lot of uh, discussion back and forth. And I said, well, look, we've had all this opinion that what we're doing is right. He was not impressed. But the lawyer was really, really scared. And he'd taken off like a coyote. Which is when my dad actually met Bill Britton, because he felt he wasn't getting good tax advice and he wasn't getting good legal advice. He surrounded himself with good people. I think of Bill Britton and the tremendous relationship between Bill and, and Ron Southern. Bill ended up saying, I think you better pay the money, Ron, because the tax advice was wrong. They did not uh, press the charges. My dad and I had to pay the taxes, but they didn't have penalties. So that was a kind of a one of those lessons learned. And that was very painful. That was a lot of savings that my grandfather and father had tucked away that they, they paid personally on behalf of the company. Ron said to me, never forget this. It's not the good deals you miss that will break you, George. It's the bad deals you make. And since then, I have to say, on a scale of one to 10, in terms of being ultra conservative on how you approach tax at Cosette, 10 ultra conservative. <laughs> Honesty is one of the irreplaceable characteristics of being a leader. I don't think you can fool yourself, and I don't think you can fool other people. I think it has to be you and the way that you conduct yourself. It was a growth-oriented company. It was a company that was always doing things, not necessarily always right, but the company was always moving. Jubail is in northern Saudi Arabia on the east coast. Xi'an Bu's on the west coast, and they said, we're going to build a major industrial city in, in both locations. We brought together all of our people from Australia and Montreal and the western part of that go into a consolidated group. There were two factories here in Calgary, and there were three factories in Australia, and our big facilities in Montreal. Eight factories produced 6,000 modules in 60 days. Yeah. Yeah, and was, uh, those, were, those were heady times. And the company was growing, because we were securing a lot of contracts at that time. It wasn't that they were just coming like one flake of snow. It was a snowstorm. 19 complete, ready to use schools in nine months. Concept, design, production, shipping, construction, equipping 400 classrooms. 6,000 miles from home in 36 weeks. They built a reputation for being solid and for being honest, and they serviced what they sold, they sold well, they did what they said they would do. We're doing big things, big things that young guys aren't supposed to be doing. <laughs> for Atco, another example of flexibility, of resource marshalling, of energy, commitment, and plain human desire. Some people, and I think Ron is one of them, just were born with a level of confidence to say, I can do this, and just go and do it. And that's what he did. Ron used to boast he had the youngest management group of any public company in Canada, and they were only going to get better as time went on. We were all very proud of that. We were a bunch of young bucks, and we were getting it done. Purchasing is leaning, leaning hard, Bob. We really had some significant contracts. The Alaska Pipeline, which was probably $100 million that we shipped up to Alaska. 7.30 a.m., December 21st, 1973. ATCO begins production for Alaska. together by barge and truck, ATCO will move some 7,000 modular and fold-away buildings, over $60 million worth, into Alaska. Alaska was 10,000 beds, and uh, 
Well, so was Syncrude, was close to that. The Aramco was even bigger than that. We had every factory that ATCO owned building the product for Aramco. We had Montreal and their facilities involved. We had the mobile home facilities in Napa, Idaho involved. We had Riverside, California involved. All the factories here. ATCO wasn't afraid. I mean, uh, there was a huge demand for camps, for instance, in uh, Quebec Hydro. So ATCO went and opened a plant in Quebec, opened two plants in Quebec. There was a great demand for camps when Manitoba Hydro was developing their hydro projects in northern Manitoba. So they opened an office in Winnipeg. The thing that really got ATCO to be where they are was their ability to make a commitment to a client, no matter the size of the job that have resulted in a very, very fortuitous circumstance where you have the right people at the right place at the right time doing the right things on a consistent basis. Very, very powerful in this world. Here is a news flash. The damage caused to Darwin by Cyclone Tracy is likely to be the worst ever experienced in Australia. Christmas Day, 1974. Complete disaster in Australia. Darwin's children spent the night huddled in bathrooms with only mattresses and the bodies of their terrified parents to protect them from the fury of the cyclone screaming like a banshee inches away. And ATCO, with operations in Australia and a product that it knew could help the people of Darwin, responded in a manner that's been come to be expected, I guess, of the company. In Adelaide, 2,000 miles to the south, ATCO recalled its employees from their annual Christmas vacation. This immediate reaction enabled ATCO to be first into Darwin. Making a difference has always been part of the culture, particularly in those short-term high-demand needs, housing, hospitals, schools, uh, emergency shelters, that type of thing. ATCO is proud to have played a small but vital part in the rebuilding of Darwin by supplying 1,200 of the 10,000 homes that will be rebuilt in a $700 million reconstruction program in the years to come. The trailer company has become like Kleenex. You know, we're, we're so well known around the world and the brand and the, and the banner and all the rest of that stuff. I mean, the whole business was invented by ATCO. They were helping build the world. And of course, there's always the guy on top hanging on to the reins, trying to steer us in the right direction. I'd go into a very unsettling situation in different countries that, uh, you, you know, you're maybe a little more at risk than for sure you're at risk. Some countries were better than others, and I remember cartoon Sudan. There's a military coup, and they shut everything down, the airport, all transportation, the whole city. We were into Algeria right after the revolution when the Algerians threw out de Gaulle's armies. There was still machine gun splatter everywhere, but that's no different than Ron did when he went to Vietnam. We wanted him to go over there and look at things and see if we could design some hospitals and all that. I mean, he went right into the zones where there was activity going on. They came up with this MASH unit, flat pack, that could be put down in the jungles of Vietnam as, a, as an emergency hospital. We came up with a packaging system that was incremental sizes and it fit into a C-130 or C-141, an air transportable container that folded up when they weren't in use. One of the difficult things for a medium-sized Canadian company today is to provide their own research and development. We had a division that was called uh, Special Projects. It was uh, really an offshoot from the Research and Development Group. That was a group in the, um, through the 60s, very dear to Mr. Southern. A very expensive proposition because there certainly is no guarantee that what you develop can be marketed. Those types of areas have always been uh, areas of interest for the company without, as Mr. Southern would say, you know, blowing your brains out. <laughs> because you can go down the R&D track a long, long way and lose sight of what your business is. We were kind of a money pit. We, we never really did make any money in it. Research and development was a big piece in those early years. And many times he said how we wished that it had never been taken apart, because I think that made quite a difference. Ron Southern was also very much a realist. 
so he wouldn't chase things that were never going to happen. That's what you have to do. I think that's leadership. One of the best Shakespearean phrases that my father would say was, you are rapidly becoming what you are going to be. There are ups and there are downs. And uh, so some of the things that we were doing were not working so well. There was one we underbid with Kaiser on the American River Dam. We decided to cater it and put in a bid that was absolutely ridiculous. We were losing a lot of money. And finally, my dad went hat in hand and met with Mr. Kaiser, who was the big aluminum siding manufacturer and one of our biggest customers. I can remember telling him that we couldn't afford to keep losing money on the catering. And him saying to me, Ron, you've sold us a lot of housing, haven't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, that's your contract, and I expect you to fulfill it. And, uh, and we did. We shouldn't have never been in the catering business. We're not caterers. We didn't know anything about it and had to trust other people. But the story gets a lot better. Lo and behold, this is the um, rapidly becoming what you were going to be part. In the 70s, ATCO decided to get into the property and commercial development business. And we built a building on 8th Avenue, 800 place. We ended up leasing nine floors of the building to Murphy Oil. And Edgar Kaiser had bought Murphy Oil, and Edgar Kaiser was building what is now the Chevron Standard Building. And Edgar had phoned Ron and said, I'd like you to let us out of this deal. I can remember my dad making another trip to Mr. Kaiser's office and saying, remember what you told me? <laughs> and a uh, promise is a promise. And he said, Edgar, you got yourself space, man. You're moving into our building. And they did. And that's something to this day I, I think is so important. We must do what we say we're going to do. We must stay committed to delivering on time, anywhere, and on budget. It's that simple. And if you're successful, great. But tomorrow's a new day, and where's the new challenge? Well, that's something I learned from my father. Ron, I can remember him saying, if you've won, you get one night to stand up and cheer. And if you've lost, you get one night to lie down and cry. Ron's dad never, in all the time I knew him, ever, ever praised Ron for anything he did. If Ron went out and made a big sale of trailers, his dad never said, way to go. It was expected. I think my relationship was the same as any boy's to his father. As you're growing up, there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of direction. I think my father is the most outstanding man that I've ever met. He applies himself completely to the task at hand. And in our company today, he's responsible for all of our production. SD was on a mission to, to bring some order to manufacturing. He was gruff, he could be loud, but underneath was a bit of a teddy bear. I really liked SD. You know, to me, I was 22 years old. To me, he was like a grandfather I never had. SD Southern, bless his soul, uh, used to pound on the table in the early days about, guys, we have to design a standard product. He was absolutely determined to bring order to manufacturing in Atco. Well, it took us a long time to get there, but then it was a godsend. He was exactly right, because people would come to you and say, I need a 400-man camp, and I need it tomorrow, and you had it in stock. He knew and loved the historical workforce housing business, but he never really got into the companies that were acquired. SD, to his credit, gave RD the opportunity to run the company and left. And he went on a two-year trip around the world in a sales capacity. I don't ever recall having a discussion with my father on transition. He was terrific in giving way to me. And when RD became in charge with his core group of people, they realized that they were somewhat one-dimensional and that they had to, uh, they had to expand beyond the workforce housing and manufacturing business, and that's when they acquired Thompson Drilling. That was big news at the time. Everybody knew there was lots of drilling activity, there was lots of money in it, it was like great opportunity, and you knew there was gonna be growth in the company and there was be stability that would go with that. While we weren't very skilled in it, we weren't unfamiliar with it, and felt that we could do a good job in exploration and production of oil and gas. People just um, 
went out of their way to learn about it, to assume the responsibilities of what a drilling company does, and just tackled it and just did it. We had a difficult time with it, but fortunately, the market was extremely strong. And when we were throwing off cash flows off that drilling business the first three years, it were mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. I think one year is $44 million. It was really wild at that time for what it was. Thompson Drilling uh, generated significant earnings and cash flow that allowed ATCO to look at acquiring, among other things, Canadian utilities. The utility acquisition was a little different because there weren't that many people at the time that thought that was the right thing to do. I was surrounded by a lot of people who did not agree at all with the fact that you might want to acquire a utility company. There's times in great leaders' lives when they have opportunities, not entirely their own making, but events converge and present themselves. And it's the proverbial grabbing the brass ring. Yeah, we looked at what was known as Pacific Western Airlines at the time, Union Oil of Canada, and a few other things. But this thing, what was known as Canadian Utilities, was owned by a firm called International Utilities in Philadelphia. It was owned in America, and so he thought that'd be great to bring that back to Canada, Alberta, and own it with an Alberta company. So he looked at that and he talked it over with Bill Britton, his lawyer at the time, and he said, you know, we should try to buy this and get this back into Canada. I mean, Alberta should own its own electricity. I think when he took on the Canadian Utilities, even though it turned out to be a brilliant long-term business move, if I was to be honest, I would say that was probably the most scared he ever was, because it was like trying to swallow an elephant in three gulps. Canadian Utilities was owned by a man named Jack Seabrook. He was a pretty uh, adroit negotiator. But as it developed, I quickly became aware that two other companies were negotiating with him. One was Alberta Gas Drunk Line, and the other one was Alberta Energy Company. And uh, Ron did the things he should have done. He contacted certain people to let them know that this was probably eminent, asked them to swear to confidentiality, all those kind of things. And when we went to do the deal, I'll say on a Monday, because I think it was a Monday, we found out that Transalta had found out we were putting a bid in. So then it reopened the whole thing. There was a real bun fight, if you like, between several corporations within Alberta to come out and who was going to be the owner of the, of the of Canadian Utilities. I mean, we're really small. It was kind of a David and Goliath story. It was like the tail wagging the dog. I mean, ATCO was very small in relationship to CU at the time. That was some fight. And I can remember Mars saying to me, what the hell is a trailer builder going to run those teapot plants? It's just a bunch of junk anyway. He took a big chance, but he knew that utilities were very stable. I mean, we had a tough ride over those first years where everything was just floppy and our stock wasn't reacting. And he thought, well, if he could get Canadian utilities, he'd always have a base because he was never going to give up on the ATCO story. That's part of his heart and soul. So I picked up the phone and I called Peter Lally. I said, Peter, what the hell is this? Here we are trying to build this company and we're having to compete against your companies. Peter didn't give me a direct response on the phone, but within two weeks, our Canadian opposition dropped away. And the utilities really, really, really did it for us. They really did it for ATCO. There's no doubt that that became available because Ron grabbed the brass ring called CU and fought like hell to get it, and that wasn't easy. But that acquisition opened up incredible opportunities for ATCO that would never have existed otherwise. And I can tell you right now, just as a sidebar, that if we'd done the Union Oil of Canada or Pacific Western, there'd be no ATCO today. And so that's the foundation. That's why he really wanted to buy Canadian Utilities. And he almost lost our company over trying to buy that, too, because it is a David and Goliath story. The acquisition of Canadian Utilities, I think, almost wrecked ATCO. As you can imagine, there was a great deal of debt on that because ATCO was a very small company. And that was fine as long as that rig money was continuing to flow in and meet those demands. And sure enough, as soon as they got the deal done, 
oil prices started to drop, the National Energy Program was introduced. And inflation around the world went absolutely crazy, and interest rates skyrocketed. And that whole process stopped our rigs from working, and that cash dried up. And it was affecting, of course, our earnings, which affected uh, our annual earnings, which affected our stock price. And, you know, it was, it was a ne big negative around our net. That was what got us in the problem, was the purchase of those utilities and the events that happened right after, which no one could have foreseen. Interest rates went through the roof. Oil went down to $10 or something. So it was a, a huge problem for ATCO because they borrowed the money to acquire CU. There were some tough years. <laughs> I think 1984, ATCO suffered its first financial loss. It was, I think it was about $5 million. Yeah, we were having a strategy conference, but this uh, business plan that we had showed that we were going to lose money and so much so that it could be fatal to the company. What was more disturbing than the $5 million loss was the fact that the consolidated business plan was showing that ADCO was going to lose another $15 million the coming year if, uh, in fact, we achieved our budgets. That was pretty disturbing. I thought about it that night and went back into the meeting the next day and said, we're all going home and I'm going to see you in Calgary once a month. We're not going to let this happen. In 82, 83, 84, every executive from every part of the world would fly into Calgary every month and would be tasked with um, objectives to achieve for the very next month or the quarter. They set targets for every unit, and every month they'd bring in the presidents and they'd all report on how they were doing. If one was dropping below the target, they'd try and find another unit that would pick up the deficiency. Boy, there were some horrific meetings. Every director came, you know, every officer would have to stand up and say, well, boss, this is why I have this shortfall, which isn't easy. It's never easy to stand in front of a group of directors and, and officers of the company and say, gee, I'm not meeting the plan. There was a general manager in Alaska, Big Stan Miller, and it was his turn to stand up. But just before that, uh, somebody had spoken about the problems that they were having. And Mr. Southern interrupted him at that point in time and said, from now on, these discussions will not be about problems. They will be about opportunities. And I was relentless on that. Stan being the next person to stand up says, Mr. Southern, up in Alaska, we're facing insurmountable opportunities. <laughs> this company definitely could have failed then. And there was no reason to think it wouldn't every reason to think that it would. I don't think anybody laughed at that, but it just stuck me as, as a very illuminating story that there are no problems, they're just opportunities that have to find a solution. We always did a what-if scenario. What if the interest rates go above 7%, which they were at the time? So the outside number we ran was 12%. And we thought, well, we can still, we can still handle that. Yeah, we can handle it. It'll be tough, but we'll handle it. Well, they went to 21%. Can you imagine that, having that debt load at 21, 22%? And at the time, a lot of companies were failing. We had to meet those debt payments somehow. And so we sold assets, we sold buildings in Alberta, we sold our business in Australia. We had to sell all our good assets because you couldn't sell bad assets. You couldn't sell a mediocre asset nobody was buying. Another tough decision he made at the time was uh, we turned in all our lease cars. There was 80 to 100 cars at corporate office. I came back out of uh, Saudi Arabia, I believe, and she, I didn't have any way of getting home. Southern was at his best, I'll tell you. He just wasn't going to accept it. He was not going to accept it. I thought we'd fail. And we went through all of the issues went right around the room, started over. I didn't know any other way to do it. And we left there and we knew what the message was and we had to get there.
I guess it worked because we did meet our target budget of being positive, and that was the only loss that I know of that I'd go ever incurred. In fact, I know it is, it's the only loss that we incurred. I can remember uh, the, the 50 people that were involved with that, only one didn't make it. A man from Australia, a good man, but he came into my office one day and he had tears in his eyes and he said, Ron, I can't keep it up. Poor old Ian Gemmell from Australia. It would take him a week to get here and a week to get back, so he would have barely two weeks to do any work. And Australia at the time had, I think, a 25-year unbroken record of profitability. So it was a very good company. My father was incredible. Even though the company was really suffering, he invested in having all the people from all over the world come to Calgary once a month to say what they were able to do and what they could do the next month. It was something, and it worked. They survived it because they brought a focus to it. They said, we have a problem here. Everybody has to understand the problem. Everybody has to participate in solving the problem. And uh, it was amazing. It was just amazing how the people in ATCO came together. And I'm proud to say that we never did default on any payments. Ron's leadership got it done. It's essential Ron Southern. I mean, he's, he's a person that could do strategy. He could strategize where the company ought to go. And I think that's Ron. I mean, that's just how he operated. It was not just the entrepreneurial vision that Ron had for what the assets in the company could do, but the insight, the tool set to move across the street to run something completely different. That was a very, very long process, the integration of the, uh, of the two cultures, completely different cultures in the two businesses. It was such a radicalization of uh, concepts of work the eight to four of the utility versus the 24 seven, 20 hour a day, seven day a week pressures of uh, the other business environments that ATCO is in. It's a real eye opener to them and it made them grow to be great people within the corporation too. There was this pollination that occurred where leaders from utilities came into the existing ATCO company and some of the ATCO leaders went into utilities and it just became this marriage of minds. We had a lot of success as a utility, but what ATCO brought in their ownership was a new way of looking at the business. I think over the years, ATCO has put its stamp on the utilities in a very, very positive way. One of the most interesting things that they did was they said, okay, you've got an asset here. Look at it in its pieces see where you can take a piece and make it bigger, change it. They had a lot of staff there, a lot of resources in the utilities that were in the planning side. But Ron realized that there might be an opportunity if we could take those resources and go into a non-regulated utility position and use those resources to do the design and pay the utilities for their services. A small team was charged with growing our business and going out and starting up independent power projects uh, across the world. Australia, British Columbia, in the end, Ontario, uh, London, England. Not of that sprung a lot of different things over the years. ATCO Power came out of it, Frontech came out of it, our ownership and midstream assets came out of it, all because of that new way of approaching the business. The Canadian Utilities Acquisition has given us stability in earnings, growth in earnings, because we've had such a growth period in the province but also access to a lot of terrific people. We ended up getting people that would spend 20 hours working on a proposal and then grab a ski jacket or something and crawl under the table, grab four hours of sleep, come back to the bench to get on with the job. We got a little old gas now, and we can use that to subsidize the new gas, which is costing us more. How many billion are in a billion again? A thousand? All right, a thousand cubic yeah, feet. Okay. And since then, it really has been a pretty incredible growth story. We went from uh, two or three power stations to uh, I think 21 is uh, where we got to. We had a very interesting time with the Barking Power Station, which was another groundbreaking um, event for the company. Uh, 1,000 megawatt in a foreign country. The 
the market opened up in the UK and we had the capability, we had the knowledge, we had the experience in the Canadian Utilities Company to be able to build power plants and so we go for it. We decided we would go right into the east end of London and as a foreigner come by land, put up this massive power station. There were two companies at the time that were early in the development cycle of power plants in the UK in this newly developing competitive marketplace, and they couldn't have been more different. The other one was a name well known to people for a whole bunch of bad things, and that was Enron. And I dealt with both of them, and it was chalk and cheese. Barking was a leading edge flagship undertaking for ATCO. A huge bite, uh, over a billion dollars, uh, a thousand megawatt power station, which is, in terms of a comparator, uh, most of the stations currently in Alberta would be half that size or less, so a big power station. Barking was the biggest that we ever built. And um, there was a lot of negotiations, a lot of legal wrangling, a lot of questions about whether or not we'd be able to build the plant, have the offtake arrangement made so that we had a contract that we could sell the power into. The Barking project was being held hostage by interests in London with respect to the acquisition of a gas supply. Uh, this is a natural gas-fired power plant. British Gas had uh, a tariff that they would sell you gas for. We were using that to predicate our economics for barking. A key and fundamental component is finding natural gas at a price and quantity that works to make it go round. And then all of a sudden, they said they were going to withdraw that tariff and replace it with a more variable one. If British Gas did that, our, all the work that we'd done and the opportunity would be gone. My dad wasn't going to accept that. And so he asked for meeting after meeting with the CEO of British Gas at the time. And he was always stonewalled. The door was never open. The negotiations were getting very critical in the UK and Mr. Southern had to fly to London, at, you know, no notice. Of course, the CEO knew why RD wanted to see him. And my dad waited, waited and waited and said he needed to speak with him. Oh, it's too late, you know, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow morning. No, I need an answer right now. You told us you would sell us the gas for this amount, and you've changed it, and I want you to honor your contract. I stayed in his hotel room that night till about 2 o'clock in the morning with him, and the discussion got pretty heated. But I told him that uh, unless he relented, I was going to make a big issue of it with the newspapers. And he made the CEO believe in his story, which was, this was a hallmark and a signature, not just for ATCO, but for deregulation and the privatization of the electricity industry throughout the entire United Kingdom. Anyway, the result was that the next day, we got notice from him that he would accept our proposition and that saved the project. And that is legendary in our company today. It was a great feat. Nobody believed he could accomplish it. He did, and he demonstrated to everybody the power of perseverance and the importance of following through with what you believe in. Barking was a huge coup. Yeah, you, you can't always say this, but the deliverables were absolutely met. It was built uh, on time, on budget, and the production outputs have been very, very good from the business, and the profitability was very, very good as well. The Barking Project probably caused Mr. Southern more stress than a lot of the other projects. Even up until the day that probably Barking turned the switch on to start, there were disbelievers and people that didn't know who from the colonies Canadian Utilities is or was, and how can they be doing this? There were a lot of bumps, and RD made it his business to be well known to the ministers who were making decisions. And he did it in his own typical style, not the brash, dreadful Enron style who could teach the world to do anything they thought, but in his own understated, very, very intellectually well-informed, supportive way. And he did that very well indeed. We touched thousands of people, very Canadian organization, setting aside the hierarchy that they had typically experienced in, in their life in business in, in 
in England and, and opened up the opportunity to them. And they just contributed in magical ways, and it turned out to be a great success. And the reason all this happens is because Ron understands people and can sit and figure out what's able to be offered by this person where they'd have fun and bring talents to bear that they don't even know they have and we can use. All the non-regulated things you see in the utilities were really because of the leadership of Ron. But it takes hard work. It, 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 it takes risk taking, not just by Ron to bet the company in buying CU or to bet both reputation and part of the company by pursuing barking, but it takes risk by each of those people to leave your comfort world and just move across to be accountable in a different way. That's risk taking. Starting up a business um, in London, England was, was uh, I think, a, a, an awesome thing for ADCO, but just uh, beyond belief for me and the learning you go through and doing that is, is, uh, is amazing. We're in Australia today in non-regulated stuff. We're in Scotland, we're in England. You know, you can go through the numbers that uh, we've had. Very, very successful. And in Alberta, too. It's like nation building. It requires all constituents to be striving for a better world, striving for a dream of what things could be. And I believe that's the people of ADCO. Oh, I definitely stayed because of the people, because of the culture of the company. And I think that's very pronounced um, even today. Mr. Southern himself, who, you know, I mean, he's got two daughters and uh, a very strong wife. So he certainly is used to having strong, intelligent, capable women around him. He recognizes it and has given a lot of women great opportunities in this company too. They've always felt that regardless whether it's male or female, they're gonna put the best person in the job. And we have a much higher percentage of females at management than the average Canadian company. I was young and there was opportunities for women. You didn't have the feeling that you had to be better than a man looking for that job. I learned how to grease axles. I learned how to change tires. I learned how to run the generators. We wouldn't have a company today if it hadn't been for my mom. My mom is as much a part of the heart of this company as my dad was. If you worked hard and you did your job and you were involved with the company, there was lots of opportunity. My father was never, he never had an issue about female or male gender. It was, if you do your best job and you are as good as you possibly can be and professional, he respected that. That's probably one of the unique characteristics of the man is his ability to read people and to understand who, who has the capabilities to do the jobs and who has the heart to do it. He tested me a lot. Would you call Conrad Black tonight at home in London? Uh, it's 8 o'clock in London and tell him I want some news coverage for the barking plant. What? <laughs> it's got to come from your heart. You know, they talk about the heart and mind of ADCO. It's ingrained in you, it's stamped in you <laughs> somewhere. What are you going to say? Uh, no, I'm not doing that. OK, <laughs> I'll do that. And call me back and let me know what he says. OK, we'll do that. They are not nine to five people. They work very hard. They're prepared to be tenacious in going after things. They had strong support at home as well with their wives or their significant others who who allowed them to work six, seven days a week or deliver a project with a short time frame. I can give you an example of one that we went through that Harry and I will remember forever. We won a contract in Kandahar to provide a lot of services, a lot of utilities, a lot of crash fire rescue and the Kandahar Air Base. Basically providing site services for 30,000 soldiers at the, the airfield. And we had 90 days to mobilize once we were awarded the contract. As part of the contract, we were subjected to a test. They would light a fire, and we would try and put it out. Everything. So they lit this fire, and we had a heck of a time putting it out because the machinery was second class, as it turned out. 
That may have been the one time I thought, oh my God, maybe this is a bridge too far. Well, we got it out and we uh, got a terse letter and we're invited to meet with the, uh, the commanding officer to discuss uh, how we might improve our situation. And we had to do it fast. Like this was in 24 hours, if this is not fixed, you guys have a real problem. Their best work is done when they're learning, when they're not sure and they're being extra diligent to not screw up. They know they don't know, but they know they've been trusted with the job, and that's when they do their best work. There were a lot of sleepless nights. We, yeah, we did wonder, did we, did we not study this hard enough? Because we put a lot into it. But we had trouble. We had to get fire trucks over there. We had to get quality people over there. And getting major equipment into a country like that, you know, we would have problems moving equipment from Pakistan into Afghanistan. We crossed the point where there was no returning. Our careers were on the line, we knew it. And we are a company that has very high ethics and, uh, and we, cannot, we cannot deal with corrupt people. We had to rely on NATO to put pressure on the governments if people were holding our equipment up. I mean, it's a war zone. And I can remember Harry and I working late into the night trying to figure what to do next, knowing that if we failed, our reputation with the client would be spoiled forever. But that's what we do well. And uh, we are, at the end of the day, a logistics company and a manufacturing company and a construction company. And those are all challenging businesses. So we actually flew in brand new fire engines from Canada on Antonovs. Of course, at our expense, because we certainly hadn't anticipated putting in new equipment. A few months later, after this fiasco, they had a C-130 actually catch fire and we had it out in 90 seconds and received the commentation from the commanding officer for the great job we did. NATO, at the end of the day, was very happy with the job that we did, and uh, certainly we, we represented ATCO very well. They weren't afraid to work hard. They worked every waking hour of the day, in some cases, and they were putting product all around the world. It, it's, it's amazing. Whether it's going into London with a power plant, whether it's ACCO structures working around the world, or financing ACCO or Canadian utilities, there was always something that was going on. It's the whole growth concept. You can't stagnate, you can't stay still, you have to grow. And when you think of the scope and scale of execution from remote camps in the most unreasonable places in the universe to uh, the most sophisticated technology in the electricity generating business, uh, the range is amazing. You know, in those down years where we had to sell off a good assets, we sold off Australia. We sold it to a New Zealand investor. He ran it into the ground after about two, two, three years. We bought it back, is how it worked in the end, reestablish ATCO in Australia. This time, the manufacturing was headquartered in Brisbane, in uh, Queensland. Nancy had come down and spoke to the people and said, we are here for the long term. We're not the financial player that's gonna buy and sell or break this up. We're here to develop, make a long-term commitment. And that was met with a lot of skepticism. Been there, heard that, who's getting chopped this time? So we're now in our sixth year, and we instituted the SD Southern Service Award, and there is a complete shift, a complete difference in their outlook. The focus of this organization, I think, has always been for the long term. There's never been a focus that we want to buy something, make a big profit, and sell it. We want to buy something and build it. The heart part is a differentiating feature. Many organizations don't have the ability to develop a heart because they're often, there are short-term uh, owners of the business. This organization has long-term owners and you need duration to establish humanity. Exactly. And I think that's the part of who's driving the bus. Mr. Southern brings that culture to the people that he works with. At ATCO, there is a secret source. And whether you say the secret source is Ron Southern, 
or the family or the people of ADCO or the ADCO heart and mind, but there is a secret source that can only come from one individual. As Artie says, and he said it many times, smooth paths are available to no one. And you have to be prepared to dodge and weave and duck, which goes to his leadership style. And he always uses the analogy of a football club. You know, if you're a halfback, you're going to you know, that kind of thing. Very much larger than life, but he is the first to credit everyone else with success. Everyone else has been the secret of the success, and he, he is standing on one side. No, he brought the team together. We got to get there, guys. He really, really did it well. And when there was a crisis, uh, he would find a way to, to lead us out of it. I used to go out to the plant quite often, and he would come out there, and he knew the name of the people working and building the trailers. Oh, uh, people loved Ron. He knew them by name, and they just loved to see him come out there and talk to them and visit with them, and he, and he would take the time to do that. He made it a point of getting to know the people, of walking around, seeing how they liked their job, talking to them. And I think Nancy today, when she goes around and she visits all the people of this company, they love her. She has the charisma as well. It's that family background that wasn't lost. Often when corporations grow, they lose a bit of their soul. Eh? The, the founders' values and business principles, well, they, they get morphed into something else. But in this case, uh, somehow, it's been maintained. It's called having visions and goals and leadership. And I think the somehow is because after SD, there was an RD, and after RD, there is a, a Nancy. And I think that's what makes this organization such a, a, unique, uh, a unique thing. And it's all really the personification of the family, the Southern family. And that includes all of them. Ron, uh, Marg, uh, Nancy, Linda. That's still the strength of um, our family and, and the companies um, that have his trademark because we never rest on our laurels. We always say, okay, well, there were fabulous things that we've done, but how can we be better? Because there's always a way to be better. RD kind of drove that effort, and now Nancy is doing the same. Linda's doing her stuff uh, through Akita and Spruce Matters, of course. So will it sustain uh, over the long haul? Absolutely. One of the things that you, you, you get to is there's no separation between you and the business because you are it 24 hours a day. And I'm not sure Mr. Southern ever let go of it. I'm sure he went 24 hours a day because I've seen Nancy do it. Nancy is unbelievable in terms of her intellect. No one had to teach her anything. She was absorbing this as she went. Oh, for sure. She grew up at the Echo Structures lot and the trailers, and she told me that was dinner. <laughs> dinner was talking about business, you know? Even Christmas dinner, she says. <laughs> She was groomed by Ron in a certain way, and you can see her thinking process and decision-making process reflect some of Ron's uh, style, but she's not Ron number two. I wanted people to know that I'm different. <laughs> um, he can't wear my high heels and I couldn't wear his shoes, <laughs> but I also wanted them to know that I believed in the same principles and that I really cared, and I know that my responsibility is to ensure that this company goes on through the generations. And so the, 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 those values have been maintained, and uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's been, been nothing but great for the employees as well, as well as the shareholders in this company. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I welcome you to the 49th ATCO Annual Shareowners Meeting. Nancy has a vision for the company. She wants to see it last. We both want to see it last. It's been very interesting watching Nancy take over. She clearly has started to show some, some uh, interesting directions already. They're looking into renewable energy uh, sources and developing relationships in the north with the Aboriginal people. Just think of the diversity. Radar stations in the north, great giant developments uh, in Australia for supporting 20,000 uh, people in LNG plants, more than 20,000 people being supported in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and the industrialization of those countries. It's definitely uh, building quality of life for a lot of people globally. My hope and my vision for this company is that it will stand the test of time in developing enduring, sustainable projects around the world that enhance our environment, 
people's lives and opportunity. Alberta Electric System Operator, a not-for-profit agency that manages our electrical system, has a plan. A multi-billion dollar upgrade for the entire province, including two high-capacity lines from coal-fired plants near Edmonton to Calgary. Alta Link would build the west line, Atco Electric the east. The Eastern Alberta Transmission Line, or EDL as it's known in the company, it's a mega project, a successful mega project that by many standards was a record breaker for Atco. We set a number of records uh, in terms of financing. For a corporate entity, the largest single tranche of uh, debentures ever in Canadian history, and that was a billion dollar issue that we had. So we set a lot of records. Eastern Alberta transmission line is 485 kilometers. It's the longest transmission DC project in Canada, just under $2 billion. Considering that projects of that magnitude in Alberta were running 50% over budget, it was uh, quite a feat for all of us to pull it together and bring it in on budget. The great thing about EDL is it really set the stage well for ATCO to continue to build the backbone in this province for major electricity needs. When you're running, uh, you know, where you've got thousands of people depend on you, you got to make sure that you've got uh, something coming in the door. I think that really is part of leadership in a major way. Striving for the highest standard, paying attention to small details, never breaking a promise, and delivering what we say we will do on time and on budget. It's not much more complicated than that. That's the kind of people that are in this company. I mean, we really did work together. I think that's how we built. It wasn't an obstacle that we felt we couldn't overcome. And that proved to be right. That's the magic. And it's worked for almost 70 years. And clearly successful. You know, astonishingly successful. And we should not be changing a successful formula very likely, that's for sure. Lots of things will change in the world. Lots of things in our organization will change. But the fact that we care about each other and that we're looking out for each other will never change. I think you can be like a bad halfback. If you're going around end and you're looking over your shoulder, then you get tackled. If you're going around end, if that's the play you're going to play, then you better go at it just as hard as you can. <laughs>